leaving out, first of all, I've got to put my cards on the table. I'm not a researcher. <laughs> Neither am I, don't worry. So, yeah. <laughs> I am a doctor, though. Yeah. Not a PhD. Controversial. <laughs> I'm a medical doctor, so um, if anyone collapses from any of the hilarity bouncing off the walls, I can tend to them. Yay! Thank you, sir. <laughs> but I'm a GP, so I think my first instinct would be to ask them how they felt about collapsing. <laughs> and then I'd check if they're on a statin or not. <laughs> now, I've uh, I set myself quite a big agreement here because I'm going to talk about stuff and autism, and I realised when I looked into stuff, it's quite a wide area. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk about a couple of things. First of all, I want to tell you about this amazing product that I found. Because, you know, if, if you buy some Rice Krispies or something, you get a free Bouncy Ball. Forget Bouncy Balls and Rice Krispies. <laughs> buy yourself some jam. Yeah. Because every single jar jam, right? I don't know how they fund this. Every single job, it's got a safety button. Hear that? Amazing. So if, you know, carry a jam, right? Walking along, see a pack of hyenas. So I don't know what you guys are laughing at. I've got a jar of jam. Sort it, safe, you know. <laughs> Fall out of an aeroplane. Oh, wait a minute, drop my jam. Sort it. Two pounds, right? Very, very sensible investment. Now, as a GP, I, uh, I have spent a lot of time interacting with phones. You know, they're always ringing. I'm ringing people. They're ringing me. So I wanted to talk a bit about how phones. I mean, they, when phones interrupt me, that's something I want to talk about later. But first of all, I want to take you back in time to when phones were first invented. So I think back to 1776. Alexander Graham Bell. And he's a very lucky man because he'd invented the telephone. And uh, I've done a bit of research. I listened to him because he's one of the first people to record his own voice. And he speaks like this Hello, I am Alexander Graham Bell. Right, so for comedy purposes, I thought, actually, I'm going to imagine that he spoke a bit more like a Glaswegian docker. So he's in the lab. He's uh, doing the research. His assistant Watson's at the other end of the building, and he's got his telephone he's invented, and he knocks over one of the batteries. And so the acid goes onto his trousers, and he's like, Oh man, I hate acid, oh no. Oh, this is terrible. This is like that scene in Aliens when it's eating away from his chest plate. <laughs> so that's a bit more tweed involved. Oh, <laughs> I need some help. If only I'd invented some sort of communication device. I invented a telephone last week! <laughs> so he goes over to the telephone. Now there's some debate about what words we use. But he picks up the phone and he calls his assistant Watson, who's up the other end of the building. And now, the words that Watson says he heard were, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. <laughs> Bell debated that, but anyway, he, so he's called Watson, he's like, ah, oh no, that sounded a bit sexual, didn't it? Did it sound, oh, he's run off, okay, oh no. He's running down the corridor, oh no. He's going to think, ah, oh, he's going to think I'm up for it. Watson run, is about to run in, he's like, I'm going to have to nip this in the bud. Watson comes in, he's like, can I stop you there, Watson? I just want to let you know that the very first phone call ever made was not a booty call. <laughs> and I'm going to write in my journal that I said, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you now, okay? Yeah, have you got that clear? None of your funny business, Watson. Now, can you help get me out of these trousers? <laughs> <laughs> And so for a hundred years after that, phones were very loud and proud. Ring, ring, you know, answer me, ring, ring, come on, I don't care what you're doing, just answer me. Until the 1980s. This was the decade of big hair, big shoulder pads, the sound of phones. Very, very small. Now, I, I heard a phone ringing in the 80s once. I think I heard it, I was right by it. And I think it went, ah, oh, ah. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. It's, like a, it's 
excuse me. Oh, uh, I'm just ringing here. Would you, would you mind? Uh, no, you carry on reading. That's all right. <laughs> because now everyone finds it much louder again. Everyone can choose music to put on their mobile phone, and uh, which means as a GP, if you're the kind of GP who perhaps runs a little late, obviously because you're very caring and you let the people talk about their problems, not because you're inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's what my appraisal say. It means that often they get in about half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour late, and, and their husband's thinking, oh, this is taking a long time, she hasn't even texted me after half an hour. So I'm in there, and it means this sort of thing happens. Well, well Doctor, um, oh, the thing is, um, I didn't really want a lady doctor. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing, but for about a week or so, I've had a very itchy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, doctor. Hey, hey, hey! Please, my husband. Hey, hey, hey! Just for a week, I've had a. I'm the fast starter. Twisted. I was so sorry, doctor. Oh, it was my husband. He's the one who gave me the thrush. <laughs> so anyway, phones, and when I, that, I don't actually mind that kind of interaction, because that's quite funny. But uh, when my phone rings, I find it irritating. And I sort of try to work out why certain things irritate me, and why I am the way I am. And I've, I've quite an interest in autism. And as I find out more about it, I sort of recognize sort of autistic Asperger traits in myself and in, in people around me. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those and why when the phone rings it's really annoying. So uh, one of the things that um, people with autism tend to find difficult or that's different about people with autism is sensory processing. So um, you know, there's some people who find the label on their shirt really annoying but can quite happily walk in the snow wearing shorts. <laughs> which is a bold fashion statement. <laughs> and, uh, Basically, you know, some senses are dialed right down, others are cranked up to 11, 12, I don't know. And um, so, for example, my son, he's autistic also, and he, um, going into a supermarket is like walking into the loudest, crappest nightclub ever, so that sensory overload of all the stuff coming at him, it's awful. And I know about crap nightclubs because I have been to Jester's. <laughs> And so that's one thing that autistic people have to do, have to filter this information. It's, um, there's a research um, or a, a theory of positives called, um, to do with the sort of overwhelming, um, the intense world theory, sorry, which is about everything's very intense, everything's very emotionally intense, stressful. And uh, that's something you have to, in real time, learn how to filter all this crazy information. Another thing that, uh, that um, people with autism have difficulty with is reading other people's emotions because they can see the details of a face very clearly, but you know, see the eyes, but sometimes linking that into actually how someone's feeling can be quite difficult. And then other people with autism, I suppose, are really sensitive to reading other people's emotions. And, uh, and you know, obviously, some people get, they say one of the diagnostic criteria for autism is lack of um, empathy. It's like, Oh God, you guys with autism, you're like so lacking in empathy for weirdos. Mm -hmm. Of course, the autistic person's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And the actual lack of sort of this such intense anxiety about not being empathetic <laughs> or not being able to interact with a normal person, a neurotypical person, actually makes them seem lacking in empathy, but it's actually a real anxiety thing. But also, autism has an incredible sort of incredible sort of powers and incredible skills. So being having to learn to, to sort of filter all this information is um, once you learn to do it, it means you can be very observant. So act, a lot of actors are on the, um, a decent number of actors on the autistic spectrum spot things about people and how people interact. Um, and um, for example, there's some very famous autistic people like uh, Nikola Tesla could look at, um, he could visualize a machine and then build it. Um, and so it's, it really sort of gives, sorry, we're right with you. So, um, yeah, basically, um, basically, sorry. Tell us more about 
Tesla. Did, Tesla, thank you, thank you very much. Sir. So basically, he he found um, he was very found it very difficult to interact with people, but was found could interact with machines. He had a pet pigeon who he actually could interact with much better than real people. <laughs> and then a uh, chap called Henry Cavendish who um, discovered hydrogen. He um, did incredible experiments. He discovered Ohm's law a hundred years before Ohm. Quite liked it. <laughs> Didn't publish it. Thought, ah, oh, I don't know about that. And he would, um, he would basically he would go to the meeting of scientists. But he would loiter in the corner and uh, listen carefully to the conversations. He wouldn't approach unless something really interested him. And he'd come and slightly to them and then just chip in a little bit of information and then step away. <laughs> but and incredibly, he invented so many things. But he didn't make a big song and dance about it. So basically, this is the thing. And as you found just now, when I, uh, I had slight trouble with a big crowd of people, um, but sometimes being, or being a bit autistic, it's difficult to interact with people. And the one thing I found is, is actually trying to do this kind of thing is a good thing. It can be very difficult. The one thing is, of course, now I'm still in a room of people I don't know. Expecting me to finish on a joke. <laughs> <laughs>